Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I wanted to speak to you about the books that I read in January and February. Now I've actually been really lucky this year because I've read a number of books that I really really loved. Now I haven't read any more than I normally read but just of the books I read I feel like it's been a disproportionate number of really really good books. So yeah that's what we're going to be talking about today. Normally I have more random stuff to ramble about in the beginning of a video but no here we are let's just jump straight into it and I'm going to talk to you guys about all of the books I read in January and February. So the very first book I read this year was called Digital Minimalism. Let me just check what the byline was. Choosing a focused life in a noisy world. This book is by Cal Newport and it was published in 2019. Fundamentally this book is about using technology in a way that is meaningful and improves your life. Now this is a topic I find really interesting because social media is like literally my job. And I'm not talking about like YouTube, I mean in terms of my day job, I'm a digital marketer. And so that means that using Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and all the things is a part of my day-to-day -day occupation. In addition to that, I'm also hyper aware that these social media platforms are designed through machine learning to be as addictive as possible because these apps care a lot about retention. You know, the more time you spend on a particular site, the more likely you are to come back on it, the more money that platform can make from advertisers and et cetera, et cetera. So that is the context in which I picked up this book. Now, it was published in 2019 and one of the problems with books about technology is that technology is rapidly changing and developing. Even though it was published in 2019, this book kind of already felt a bit out of date and a bit out of touch. The practical and tangible advice that came out of this book was that in order to try out digital minimalism, you had to like really, really rancidly, rapidly? What, what word am I thinking of? Um, radically. <laughs> okay, you have to really radically remove all of the technology from your life that you can live without. For the spans of a month, you need to uninstall Facebook, uninstall all of the apps, you need to move away from everything technology related that you don't absolutely 100% need. See what things you're missing and what value you're missing out of and then slowly reintegrate those things back into your life. So maybe, for example, you find a lot of value in seeing your siblings' baby photos on Instagram, but you don't get a lot of value from doom scrolling on Twitter. Maybe reinstall Instagram, but don't reinstall Twitter. That's the sort of advice that he's giving. I gave this book three stars because I did enjoy seeing this person's like perspective on technology and reading about how like highly addictive social media is. And I think that it's really important that we're very mindful of the things that we do in our daily life. However, there wasn't heaps of tangible stuff to take out of this book like there wasn't a lot of like really meaty interesting advice it was really just that one simple premise of do a digital detox and that's it and I also felt like the tone of the book was a little bit superior and a little bit up itself like in terms of there was a few disparaging comments about like World of Warcraft and pictures of dogs on Twitter. Like honestly, the cute animals on Twitter are like 90% of the reason I still use Twitter. I get a lot of value out of seeing cute animals on the internet. I think all of you are very aware of that by now. Yeah, I didn't sort of like the vaguely judgy tone of the author. Okay, so moving on, the next book I wanted to talk about is The House in the Cerulean Sea by TJ Clune. Oh my god, I love this book so much. This is a book that we read in January for our book club over on Patreon. If you're interested in checking that out, there's a link in the description down below. Um, every month we pick a book together, we analyze it, we talk about it, there's a wrap-up video, I do a deep dive on my thoughts and all the stuff. Um, but yes, if you'd like to check it out, there's a link in the description. I put this on our poll for Patreon and I'm so happy that everyone chose this book. Before I keep gushing about how much I love this book, I really should tell you the plot. We have our main character whose name is Linus Baker. He is a caseworker for the department in charge of magical youth. And his job is to pretty much go out to orphanages and write a report on whether or not that orphanage is doing everything correctly, if it needs to be shut down. And it's so whimsically dull and sad and yet yeah, just very gloomy. And then one day he gets a case to go to a particularly dangerous orphanage. Now the magical kids are put into these orphanages because they're considered to be a danger to greater society. There's a lot of discrimination against magical people in this world. And he goes to the titular house in the Cerulean Sea and he meets six children and their caretaker. All the children have their own magic. One of them is a wyvern, one is a were Pomeranian, one is a great big green glob, one is a gnome, one is the antichrist, and one is a... I always forget what fear is. Is she a nymph or a fairy? I think she might 
be a nymph. And it is Linus's job to determine whether this particular orphanage should be kept open. Linus's life at the beginning of the story is so dark and colourless and sad and there's so little joy in it and then all of a sudden he gets on this train to go to the Cerulean Sea and the world just becomes bright and colourful and highly saturated and when I was reading this story I could see the colours shift in my mind really really clearly like I felt like the setting was painted so vividly and so strongly. The thing I really really loved about this book though was the characters. Honestly like Linus, I love him. I would absolutely die for Linus. He's like, I think around 40 years old. He's so sad at the beginning, but he's just a really believable and realistic character. This book has really beautiful representation of like fatherly love and father figures. The love story that's in this book is possibly one of my favorite love stories I've ever read. It was like the cutest thing I've ever read. I don't want to give away any spoilers, but there's so many scenes with the children where I just, it was just so cute. But yeah, pretty much I've never happy cried while reading a book before but while reading the last sort of chunk of this story my heart just got ripped out of my chest again and again there were sad bits there were really really happy bits I just loved this story so much and I cannot recommend it enough the next book I wanted to talk about was Saga Land by Richard Feidler and Kari Guslison now the reason I picked up this book is because I had already read Ghost Empire by Richard Feidler and I really really enjoyed it and I wanted to read more of his work this book is about Iceland and the Icelandic sagas which from what I could tell are pretty much the folk tales of like the families of the people of Iceland Iceland. I'm not sure how much of it is fictitious and how much of it is historical but it's really really interesting and such a different type of story to what I've read before. And on top of the fact that this book is about the traditional Icelandic sagas it also weaves together the like personal story of one of the authors, Kari. So he is half Australian and half Icelandic and he is sort of the product of an affair. He wasn't accepted by his father's family because his father didn't tell anyone that he'd had an affair and that he'd had a son with an Australian woman. So it's sort of about Kari who like mostly grew up in Australia going back to Iceland and his story about integrating with his culture and his family and the fact that he is rumored to be related to Snorri Sturluson who is one of the most prominent writers of the Icelandic sagas. I think it was a really really cool premise for a book and honestly I learned so much about Iceland. I didn't know anything about Icelandic history or Icelandic culture or the story stories or the sagas or anything like that. I didn't quite love it as much as I loved Ghost Empire but I still really enjoyed it and felt like I got a lot out of it. The only sort of gripe I had with the story was that I struggled sometimes to keep up with all of the different names and the sagas like jumped around a lot and there were a lot of different family members who had names that like I had never heard before because they were Icelandic and so I sort of struggled sometimes to 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 remember who everyone was but I think that's just the nature of like the traditional medium of the sagas so it's not really a big gripe for me um so yeah I really did enjoy it I would probably give it four out of five stars the next book I want to talk about is The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden now this is the book we read for our book club in February I have had this book on my list for absolutely ages because I borrowed this from my sister-in-law and it's been sitting on my shelf and I've been really really wanting to get to it now this is a book that's loved by quite a few people and so I was really really hyped to read this book. Unfortunately, um, I didn't love it quite as much as I was hoping to love it. Like it's set on the edge of the Russian wilderness, it's very fairy tale, it's it's set in the like, sort of time period where fairy tales are set. So it's like very much the things that I love but it just sort of fell down a few different ways for me. Okay so this is a historical fantasy novel that's set in very very snowy sort of rural Russia. Our main character is named Vazia. She is a young woman, I actually kept forgetting how old she was, maybe she's like a late teen. And she is like sort of like our like not like other girls character. She can see demons and all of the sort of creatures of the forest that other people cannot see and her major conflict is the fact that she doesn't want to be married off, she doesn't want to go to a convent, she wants all of the opportunities that her brother has. She wants to fight with swords and, and do like non-ladylike things, she doesn't like sewing that sort of situation. The spot where this book sort of fell down for me was the fact that I couldn't really connect with the characters. I didn't really feel like any of them were like especially believable or real so when these big emotional things happened in the book I read them and really kind of just felt nothing while <laughs> these horrible things were happening I just like felt absolutely nothing I felt no emotion I didn't get sad like it was just 
empty. <laughs> and honestly, the book really, really labored on the fact that women were supposed to do certain particular things in this setting. Honestly, I really like that theming. Like, I, I really like exploring how, like, gender affects how people are treated and, like, people's expectations within society and people trying to subvert expectations. All of this is stuff I normally, like, really enjoy reading about because I think it's a really, like, interesting topic. Um, however, in this particular book, I think there are instances where something is historically accurate and it's a part of the world building and it's a part of the story where the character has to like overcome this particular thing and it's a part of the character arc and then there's sort of this thing being overwrought <laughs> and it just feeling like it's being labored on for no reason like i for me with the way i read this book I sort of felt like it was more in this direction than in that direction. And I feel kind of bad about that because a lot of people really, really love this book and a lot of people I think were expecting me to really love this book. That sort of like overwroughtness with the gendering in this story really kept ripping me out of it. There were a number of positives to this book though, like I really liked the snowy setting and I think this would be a good book to read around Christmas time. I think it would be a really good cozy book to read. And also the world building was one of the stronger parts of this book for me. Like I really liked the little demons of the house and like the creatures of the forest and I loved reading about like the Russian folklore and all of that aspect of it was really interesting. Like I feel like the author did a good job of integrating as much Russian folklore into the story as she possibly could. Yeah, it was just there were a few things that really made the book fall down for me so I didn't love it as much as I had expected to love it um, and so that sort of made the book around a three stars or maybe a 3.5 stars for me. Okay, and now the last three books I read between January and February was the fifth season series by N.K. Jemisin and oh my god I loved this series so incredibly much. Honestly I'd heard so many good things about this series and this series is the only series that's ever won three Hugos in a row. So it was really, really hyped for me and I really wanted to love it. I had heard that it had like lots of like amazing world building. So I went into reading this book with all of that context and honestly, I was still absolutely blown away by it. Before I ramble too much about how much I love this, let me just tell you guys the plot. This is a dystopian fantasy story with a lot of sci-fi elements to it. We have three point of view characters. But we start the story with Essun and on the day that pretty much the world ends horrible stuff happens pretty much the apocalypse is here she comes home from work and she finds out that her son has been murdered and her daughter has been kidnapped now the world is in absolute disarray everyone is freaking out and Essen doesn't care about any of that because she's going to go save her daughter honestly that is the extent of what I can tell you without giving you any spoilers but the story is so much more than that the world building here is some of the most amazing world building I've ever read like honestly the chapters are broken up with these little epistolary segments which include like letters from researchers who are researching the dead civilizations that came before these people there's lots of mystery surrounding this and slowly you're like uncovering the mystery as you read the magic system here is really really interesting there's like so many different ways that different cultures of people get treated and just genuinely it's such a strong amazing enormous world I will say that it's a bit of a learning curve when you jump into the story like this isn't particularly particularly an easy read because you have to really concentrate because it's such a learning curve in terms of the world building. For me, I, I thought that there was no info dumping, like I thought that the amount of information that got communicated to the reader was just perfect and it was constantly interesting. Every single point as I was reading, I was totally engaged with the story and I desperately wanted to know what was going to happen next. It felt so real and gritty and believable and when horrible things happened in this book, I felt every tiny bit of it like deep in my soul. It was just so evocative and strong as a story. The quality of the story is just amazing and I thought it was absolutely excellent. I loved it. Please, please go read this book series. I cannot tell you enough how much I enjoyed it and I can't really, really reveal any more about the plot without giving stuff away but it's just the premise is so small for such an enormous world and an enormous story that's just beautifully, brilliantly told. I love this book series. I'm definitely going to go read N.K. Jemisin's other work now. Um, yes, I loved this book series series so so very much. Absolutely five stars, I just thought it was brilliant. Okay and those were all of the books I read between January and February. At the moment I am currently reading 
Do androids dream of electric sheep by Philip K. Dick? I have only read one chapter of this so far. Honestly, I was already a bit surprised by how funny and dry the humor is here. I borrowed this from a friend, so I'm excited to keep reading and see what I think of it. And also I'm currently listening to a book called Never Split the Difference, which is about negotiating and it is by Chris Voss and Tal Raz. This book was recommended to me by one of my old bosses who said that it was really good and helpful to them. Chris Voss was actually the head of the FBI's like hostage negotiation team and he sort of takes the techniques that they had for like the FBI and this hostage negotiation that they did and applies it to everyday life. And it's really, really good. Like it actually has a lot of like really good tangible advice for everyday stuff. And yeah, that is what I'm currently reading as well. Um, this morning I watched the trailer for the new Shadow and Bone TV show that's coming out on Netflix. And oh my God, the trailer looked really, really good. I haven't actually read the Grisha series before. Like I'd heard sort of mixed things about it, even though I really loved Six of Crows. So I hadn't picked it up yet, but the TV show looks so good. So I'm probably gonna actually read that next maybe. Let me know what books you guys have been enjoying at the moment. I am of course always looking for recommendations. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care and I will see you next time. Bye bye.